All right, welcome back to Beyond Mortgage. My guest today is Greg Gale. Greg joined the mortgage industry in 2005. Prior to that, he was a personal trainer and martial arts instructor for 17 years. While practicing martial arts, Greg learned persistence, honor, and integrity. They were part of his daily practice and was a perfect lead-in for his role as a financial advisor in the mortgage industry. Greg built a team, the Gale team at Nova Home Loans. He's the leader that stresses the importance of integrity, a positive attitude, patience, creativity, and respect for all things. Greg's a regular contributor to the American Heart Association and Susan G. Komen Foundation. He's a spouse and a father. Welcome, Greg. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it. That's a great introduction. Oh, you're, you're, you're very, very welcome. And it's exciting to, to, to have you on the show. Um, you know, for the, for the benefit of the guests, maybe you could, I, I'm really interested in hearing, man, you've got this, you know, career as a personal trainer and martial arts instructor. I mean, it wasn't just a, a two-year job. It was a 17-year career. And w- what took you, like what pulled you from that into the mortgage industry in 2005 because in 2005 I, I think you probably took 2005 kind of learning the business a little bit a little bit of learning still in 2006 you probably get it going and then 2007 eight boom Damn. <laughs> so i want to hear you know why you got in and and kind of how you made it through those first you know four years yeah well i'm kind of getting slammed that's where the martial arts came in where you're supposed to get back up again right um yeah so to go back to the personal training you know when i came out i was originally from massachusetts boston i came out to go to college at arizona state uh i got i didn't really know what i was doing right i kind of jumped into my first major which was computers uh i was good with math good with computers i went into that major i didn't like the major i didn't like programming i did it was uh, and it was way overwhelming huge anniversary you know, like this university was just overwhelming two three hundred people in a class i'm like wow so I actually got on academic probation and ended up going to the community college for a semester and kind of got my bearings around, you know, other things. So I got with a great counselor that said, hey, why don't you just knock out your prerequisites while you're just figuring out what you want to do? Great advice. It was really good. And I'd give that advice to anyone that's going in there like, man, don't don't lock it in on the first year, but maybe, you know, see what you like. And it kind of like coming into even the mortgage industry. I'm like, hey, kind of see if you're going to be in sales or ops and just figure it out. And then, and then eventually we'll place you where you kind of resonates with you. But going back with the college. So I kept driving by this, this martial arts school and kept driving by. And just something was, I don't know, someone was just drawing me to it. So finally I just pulled in and I was like, hey. And, you know, meanwhile at ASU, I was probably uh, 5'10". 160 pounds, maybe, you know, and, and you're there and there's no intramurals for that size kid, you know, everyone's huge, and you know, tackle and whatever. And I'm like, that's not for me. Um, so I go into this martial arts school and this gentleman, uh, Ray Fisher, uh, it took me on a tour. I was just all enamored later to come to find out he's really good with sales and presenting and stories. Right. And so anyways, he sells me on the place. And I signed the two-year contract. I get going. And you had no martial arts experience prior to that? Zero. Zero. (laughs) That's great. That's great. Uh, You know, seven. I was 17 when I came to ASU. I was about 18 by now. Uh, And yeah, I was just, but I was enamored, right? And and, and fortunately, I fell into a great style. So the style was Kempo, which is a lot of stand-up, punches, knees, elbows, close contact, pressure points. That was really good. He ran one of the only full-time martial arts schools and highly successful because most martial artists, they're, they're good with the martial arts, but it's hard on the business. So mm-hmm. they normally have a full-time job and they just teach like nights and weekends to a handful of kids out of their garage. And, or the schools are closed during the day and they open up at night when that person gets off their normal salary job because you can't really make a living. My teacher made a living. He was getting the college kids. He was getting the kids, he was getting the adults. He, I mean, he was... It was open from 9 a.m. till 10 at night. So eventually, I, I just loved it so much. I turned my major into exercise science, physiology, wow. pre-med. I was all in on the martial arts. Um, I remember, So I had a conversation with him once. This is like a turn. You know, you have these, Dan, you know, you have these sliding door moments in your life. Yeah, where, yeah, yeah. You know, one way or the other. So I'm sitting there and he calls me in the office and I don't know, I was kind of like, 
getting by. Like I was good, but I was so good that I didn't really put in as much effort as I really could. And so he's like, man, you're talented. I've got no coaches that can train in the morning when you come and train. So you can only train with me. I'm only training if you commit and wow. because you've canceled so many lessons in the past. Now you have to double up to catch up. I'm going to train you two or three times a week until you're caught up. And, and then, or, or here's the sliding door, or I will rip up your contract right now. Mm -hmm. You pick. And I was like, huh? And right there, I'm th like the thought just went in my head. I'm like, no, nah, I can't do without this. This I came here for a reason. I made a commitment. I'm sticking to it. I'm in. Not only wow. now, I was wow. able to train with the man, right? Like, like that thought did wasn't the first thing that popped into my head. Later on, it came to me like, wow, I'm getting like straight instruction, unfiltered, not passing through anybody else from the man. And and man, that was a great run. So um, it's amazing. Forward. It's amazing. He uh, he spotted it spotted the talent and you know because yeah. if you weren't working that hard if it was just coming natural i mean he saw that hey man this this young guy's got got what it takes that's a good point i mean look you i could put you in front of somebody who you identify as man that person would be good in sales loans you know you've been mm -hmm. doing it for so long and in front of so many great producers kind of the same talent right so not knowing that at the time i'm like yeah i'm, I'm going that route and so trained with him fast forward you know, graduate college, uh, get my degree, exercise science, physiology. I had been now at ASU for eight years. I was not a doctor. <laughs> so I had that stint where I got academic probation, came back, did my thing. And honestly, I wasn't all in on school either. I was actually all in on the martial arts. Right. I was putting in the time there. I was full time there. I would pick classes at college that worked around my martial arts calendar so I could put in more wow. dojo. Cause that was my thing. I'm like, man, I'm going to open up my own school. I'm going to have Greg's dragon martial arts and wellness center. And obviously at the end, I was like, you know, I talked to Mr. Fish and I said, you know what, man, uh, managing this place and learning all the sales and stuff from him was awesome, but I wasn't ready for the leap to franchise and like pay a fee, open up my own business. I wasn't that business savvy. Did he want you to at that time? Did you have that opportunity? Yeah, that's what he was ultimately grooming me for. Um, and I think his vision was, hey, like, let's let's multiply. Let's get another dojo, another part of town. You run that one. I'll run this one. We'll partner up and maybe we'll do another one. So he had a big vision and it, and it was really cool. Um, I just wasn't in alignment. I, I didn't feel that. And so in 2005, we didn't part ways. Um, I still trained with him, yet I went and became a personal trainer at this high-end health club, and my very first client was a mortgage broker. Okay. <laughs> so she, her name was Kathy at the time, but she, Kathy is her name. So I trained her, and right around you know that time, I, she was my very first client, training her, great lady, and my wife now, but girlfriend at the time, wanted to get into real estate. And when mm. I was talking to the broker about it, she's like, She's like, man, she should get into loans. There's more money. It's more fun. She should do loans. Have her interview with me. So I had Katie, my wife, introduce, introduce them together. So they met and my wife started as a secretary and then became like an opener, a processor, a loan officer, an assistant, assistant VP of the whole brokerage after four years. And so by that time, I was, I was ready. I was like, man, I'm done training. I'm doing 14 hour days. Again, nowhere to go. Either open up your own gym and have people work under you, get an override, do that, or go find something else. And most of the people at this high end health club were entrepreneurs, top salespeople, day traders, uh, medical sales, like, you know, big, big guys. And so, and gals. And so they were all like, dude, you need to get into sales, something sales, something that's, that's happening all the time. Uh, you got to get, you know, there's, there's no, you're capped here. And so I, um, my wife introduced me to a top producer at the brokerage. So, and you've been hearing about more the mortgage business now for four years and, you know, how people are thriving and, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, I'd go to their office. So to meet my wife, I'd go to the office and I'd see the broker that I'm the trainer of. I'd see her husband that I'm training him. I would get, I'd befriend all the loan officers. Obviously I'm there hanging out. Though. I'm going to all the Christmas parties, right? Just hanging out, doing the stuff. And, and finally she's like, Hey man, JB's looking for an assistant. You should, you should jump into mortgages. These guys are doing really well. I think you'd be good at it. So I interviewed with JB and 
you know, it's a Friday afternoon, two, three o'clock. I roll in, interview with him. We pencil out a deal. Um, he's like, man, I got to go. I got to go get a check from the title company. And I was like, well, I'll go with you. He's like, hmm. again, I look at that as another sliding door moment where I could have yeah. been, okay, yeah. just, just let Katie know if we want to meet next week or something, just casual. Or like, I'm sitting there like, no, man, don't let this opportunity go. And so I jumped in the car with him, drove to the title company, we still continued our conversation, came back. Um, we ended up hanging out over the weekend too. And then the next week he's like, hey man, what is it going to take to make this, a, make this offer work? And so we did. Um, literally I have a, like a, a yellow piece of paper that he wrote on the yellow pad, exactly what it was. Like we're referral based. It's all about the relationship. Pick up the phone. It's not wow. that difficult. Uh, I mean, it's really like super simple, but profound to where the production this kid was doing. And then I came in and we ended up. So were you his, were you his first assistant? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, honestly, I mean, I think we both were kind of blessed to get each other, right? I had a great mentor. He stayed in his lane. He delegated a ton to me. He inherently just trusted me on everything. And I ran with it and then come back for more. And we just, we just blew up. We had more loan officers. Our, our, we moved and opened up our own branch of the brokerage. So the main broker and my wife are running this one. JB and I are running this one. And same, it, co same company, different branch concept, different branch, same concepts. I mean, but we were just killing it. And, and everyone was like, how are you guys doing so much more than them? And just super efficient. Um, great model. Uh, he was just, JB was just profound. So this is 05, 06, 07. In late two, in 2008, we started looking around at different places to go. Cause being a broker, we were like, this isn't going to work. Started to actually feel that suffocation. Yeah. And, we're like, damn, we, we, A, we need to get to a place where there's bigger fish that we can be chasing after and mastermind with and just bigger loan officers to chase. Uh, number two, we needed to have more control, like in-house underwriting, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, eh, later that year, it's been now 12 years since that time, um, JB passed away in an ATV accident. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I got a call middle of the night from his mom. I called oh, him. Man. No, uh, he wasn't married. He didn't have kids, but he had a huge, huge influence on a lot of people. And I mean, especially myself, uh, you know, I, I thank him a lot. It's not every day, but it's most days that I'm thanking him for my opportunity that he gave me and that I just kept that going. But all with his basic principles, I still catch myself saying things that he said then. Wow. He, and when, when was this tragedy? It was uh, the 10th of September in 2008. Okay. It was exactly 12 years and a couple months ago. Um, we celebrate his anniversary every year. Um, we have like a celebration of life, get a couple of friends together. I'm still in contact with his mom. His mom actually set up a, a charity fund at ASU. So there's a scholarship at ASU that I put and donate to because it's, it's a way to give back and leave a legacy. It's mm -hmm. called the Common Leader. And it's basically going towards kids nice. in the nursing college that they're hitting a certain number, like, the, and they're not, they're like hitting a certain number and need some help to get them to the next level. And then the, they, they get done and they go and impact a whole bunch of lives. And because JB's brother is in that field too, she wanted to tie them together. Um, with JB's passing, he was tied to ASU with his brothers being in the health field. She's like, let's mm -hmm. these together. And, and I try to cont contribute and keep that legacy going. And, and I think that's a, that's a big thing for most people is they want to be able to leave a legacy and his mm -hmm. legacy just keep impacting people all the time. Wow. Well, wow. thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That can't be, that can't be easy. I, I lost, I lost my wife of 23 years uh, in, in October of 08 from leukemia. So it was a, a basically a month later to the day. Um, and uh, so I know what it's like for something to happen suddenly, non-expecting, um, and right in the middle of financial chaos, a lot of change. So yeah, I, I get it. So you, you took over the business, I think. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Well, so after that, so about three months before, uh, my wife stopped working because she was about to have our first child, Kai. And so Kai was born the month after JB passed away. So wow. lots, we, but we shut down the brokerage. Um, I was already moving. So I came to my current company, Nova. Uh, that was 12 years ago. Um, 
I we had our baby, <laughs> and I had no. <laughs> It, here's, so here's the funny thing, Dan. So I'm going, I, I had these tickets to go to this leadership class and it was like an event at a church and there's like all these speakers there. No one we, I would even remember now. And I go there and I'm leaving and on the, on the table as I'm leaving, there's these CDs and it says the core training and I'm like, oh, sweet. It's a workout CD. <laughs> I'm in the team, right? I, it's the reticular activator. So I grab it, I throw it in the car. And as you know, it's, it's Rick Ruby with the core training, just slamming like, you know, clear off your desk, clean out your car, have a clean closet, you know, you know really know yourself, have a realtor relationship-based business. And I was like, oh, I like this guy. And it was just super clear, super direct. And I literally drove the 45 minute drive home. I pulled off at my office building at Nova that I just started with a month ago. And I literally just logged online to their website, $89 a month. I'm like, send me the program. I start following their stuff. Cause literally, you know, I lost my mentor. I lost the kid that right. every day was, would, would have a blank piece of white paper on my desk with his scratch on it, telling me what, what needed to get done that day. And then he, he, he was already in the office. And then we turned it around to where I would say, Hey, come to the gym. So I was training him at the gym. We would have our business meetings while we worked out. We'd steam oh, and wow. we'd work together. We had a lot, like we had a lot of time like syncing up. And so after that's gone, I'm like, man, I, I had no direction. I'm at a brand new company. I got none of the people around me. I had my one processor that I brought from my previous brokerage. And I'm like, now what? You know? And so fortunately I fell upon the core training. And so I started doing their stuff. Called the listing agents. I got a deal. I'd call realtors in our Rolodex that we had. And we were basically refining a lot of people because at that time you do 80, 20 refi, 80, 20, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. put in your calendar for 90 days and refi them later. So mm -hmm. that's why we just had a great machine and, and JB's mind just was so forward thinking that we were prepared. So without his forward thinkingness, I was like, I was just lost because I had no direction. And so fortunately I found that coach with the core and, and just followed their stuff. I, you know, I surrendered to that. Wow. Cool. Now, at, the, at that time, did you know how to structure deals? Did you know that part of the business yet? Okay. I did because I, like JB would take the app and like he'd structure it, but I would just pay attention. And my wife did that to me one day. She goes, do you, do you, are you paying attention? And I go, what do you mean? And she's like, well, he's handing you the sheet with the, <laughs> the pricing. All I had to do was watch the market and, you know, and you know, Barry Habib, right? So I'd watch Barry. I'd watch the stats. I learned the numbers. So I knew pricing time the market. And he goes, here's what I want to make. If you make us a little more, great. If you make us a little less, I'm not going to be happy. So just make us that much or more. I'm like, great. So I'd watch. And sometimes I'd lose. I'd be like, hey, dude, I'm sorry, man. He's like, it's all good. You made it up on the other ones, you know? And, and so I got really good with the numbers, but I wasn't paying attention to the programs until my wife said, hey, pay attention. Wake up. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> 20, 30, our best month was 58 loans just together. Now, those are the days where it was- This is know, just you and your wife? No, this is me and my butt, me and JB. Oh, you and when J, okay. So when he was structuring the loans, he would say, hey, this one's going to, you know, US Bank. This one's going to, you know, IndyMac. Right? There, were, there oh. weren't many people doing that many transactions back then. That yeah. was big. Yeah, he was, thank you. He was, he, he was just a monster, man. And again, big- a lot of relationships, but very deep relationships. When he did pass and, and we had his services, I mean, it was standing room only, out the door, and, and it was, the calls were endless. I mean, it was, he had a huge impact. He was 28 years old. He was about to be 29. Uh -huh. It just made like big heart, big impact. And so when I'm sitting there learning from him, like I, like I was just doing my job, I'd see the files, they'd go through, kind of getting it. But then when I, my, when my wife was like, Hey, like pay attention to what, what he's doing, I'm looking and started studying. And then I started like studying the guidelines and learning all the stuff and really getting good at it. So when I made the move over here, that part was not a problem for me. Mine was having the plan of how to get in front. And it's a contact sport that I didn't understand that I needed to build the base that JB had, which was get in front of all these people that have the capacity to send you business and have a genuine interest and like and hang out with them so that they'll continue to be in relationship and a deep relationship. And I don't know if I need as many, I just need to be deeper with a few that, you know, they, they fit within your standard, right? They're kind, 
they're nice, they have a good business, they're loyal, they're, you know, maybe family centric, you know, things like that. Like what's, what's kind of your standard that you hold for those? Somebody you'd have over for a barbecue as opposed to, you know, some, some guy calling you up and screaming and yelling that the deal's having problems. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So I was fortunate just in the fact that I was able to find another mentor just to be able to feed off of, get the ideas, get the direction because I didn't have it anymore. And so that, that, and that was the key for me. And then from there, it's just been, you know, like you've seen build the team. And then from there, I had the branch opportunity, which was just more impact. So I don't recommend it unless you have a solid team because you can't give enough attention to keep a branch. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so wait, when you, so when you went to, to Nova, did JB's business those relationships follow you at all? Would you, were you leaving with a ton of volume and no, no real help except for your processor? Yeah. Well, when we left, I literally closed out the pipeline at the old brokerage, took about okay. a minute to close it out. And the relationships, I mean, were mostly, they were JVs and mine, but I had the clientele, but again, the market was crashing. So yeah. there was yeah. company except for short sales. We didn't really have a lot of realtor business. It was people coming to us for deals. It wasn't so much the realtors. We had a few, but it wasn't like 50 realtors that were sending us 10 deals a month each. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I probably had a half a dozen realtors that I was reaching out to, 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 but those people were not the ones that were doing anything because again, we were crashing. Right. So I then had to seek out the ones that were still doing business because there were still thousands of deals happening. They were just going to the bank owned. The repos, yep. You know? Yeah, and so I had to chain and pivot and JB would have had to done the same thing. We would have said, hey, man, we got to pivot and go after the people that are still doing deals. So let's find who's doing short sales right now. Like who are doing deals right now? Where is the opportunity in that market? Well, you you know, a lot of people didn't survive. So congratulations on uh, making it through. And that's where probably a lot of your leadership growth really started. Um, so so tell me, like, give me a a timeline of how you, how many deals you were doing when you built your team. So you, you brought on your first assistant, probably an LP one, LP two, you were probably following the core model, right? No, <laughs> no. <It's>, uh, <laughs> when, I was, when I was doing the core, I was on their CD program. So I would listen to the CDs, which mm. gave you good information, but it wasn't the whole picture. Got so it. When I joined coaching to correct everything, I was still doing it a little bit wrong. But my first hire was a marketing rep from a title company because they knew a lot of realtors. Okay. So I reached makes out. Makes sense. To, well, it made <laughs> sense. If they hadn't built out the engine to deal with the deals coming in, the leads, right? So I didn't have the, the doctor nurse set up. Uh, I, so it was just me. And so I hired that person to bring in more deals and here's where it gets crazy. So I went from, you know, maybe a 40 to 50 hour work week trying to like scratch and claw at stuff to having to work 80 hours all by myself with the marketing guy bringing in deals, <laughs> but he couldn't do anything else to bring in deals. And so my wife's like, what are you doing? Like, do you want to just, she's like, you should just go work for a retail bank so you can be done at five. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not the life we want. All right. right? But we sat down and had those kind of conversations. And so that's when I, I reached out to the core and said, hey, I got to fix this. And they said, hey, you just need to hire two people. I'm like, what is that? What do you mean? That's a lot of money. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, and at this time, how many transactions were you doing? Uh, like 12 to 18 by okay. myself. Okay. Well, that's good. That's that's awesome. It's a lot, but I'm doing 80 hours a week. So my core- yeah, but you could, you could afford the two people at, cool. at that point. Yeah. Yeah, I was short sighted. I needed that other person to go, Hey, man, wake up. Because again, I'm coming from the I was the assistant, not, Hey, here's the experience of hiring assistant. So I needed somebody else to educate me like, Hey, man, that's probably like a deal or two a month, maybe to bring on that person. And I'm like, huh. And when you do the math, right, then you can figure out like, yeah, I could do that. And so I did. So I hired that person. And, you know, then that added to the product. It actually, the production stayed the same and my hours came down. So I went from like 80. Okay, very cool. I hired my first assignment, which was awesome. And and honestly, it saved my marriage, right? Like doing sure. 85, she's a single mom, really, right? She literally said that. She goes, Greg, I feel like a single mom. Like you're never here. I get you. I get your thinking, put the roof over the head, food on the table, I'd rather have you here. And so that was like the wake up call for me to say, I got to fix this. There is a way. And again, that's that moment, right? I could have blown up and be like, what are you talking about? 
or I could have been, that's, that's the way it is. Or I could say, Hey, let's figure this out. And so hired one hired two. What were the first two people doing for you? Uh, applications. Um, so this was pre-licensing too. So I could bring anybody in and, you know, take an app, right. Fill in the blank of encompass and, and such. But then once we went to licensing, it was okay. I need a licensed person in here to do these activities, but it was an application taker. It was that true doctor nurse. So, you know, uh, the, someone calls in and I'd say, Hey, great. So, um, let's see, Jennifer was my first one said, Hey, Jennifer is gonna take your information and book us a time to, for you to come into the office. She'll give you directions and in a, a, a package of stuff to bring me. Okay, cool. And then here they come where it used to be JB would structure it, tell them, Hey, Greg's going to go over these disclosures with you. I'll go over this. And he would literally highlight rate payment, cash to close rate payment, cash to close. And we just go over that stuff with them. And they'd be like, Greg will take care of the rest. And I'd take him through the, all the disclosures, sell the funny jokes that he told me to tell at certain spots and, <laughs> um, and just move the file into the same system for the jokes. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so um, advising loan officers today that don't yet have an assistant or leaders, um, when would you have it? it doing it differently at what point in your production life is it you know 10 deals is it 15 to 18 like you were doing when when should you bring on your your first assistant yeah i think um it depends on how much support your company gives you too like there might be some ancillary people that your company are providing that might get you a, a little bigger band with yourself like for example my company has the front desk secretary they have a marketing person. They have someone who scrubs docs going in. So you could probably get about 10 deals out of one LO at Nova and still work a 40 to 50 hour work week. Okay. At most companies though, don't have so many assets helping them. So typically with the core, we say five to six deals, depending on your market. So let's just call it six. And I would say though, that you've got like six back-to-back -back closing. So January, February, right. you're projecting five or six for March, because what's going to happen, as you know, is the production's here, but then the production crashes right. got into the files. Right. And it I don't need an assistant out. anymore. I only have four <laughs> transactions. Right. And the reason <laughs> why is because they got sucked into the files and stopped that the base right. activity, you know, it's that, that thing where you've just got to get addicted to the mundane of every day there's sales calls happening. And if you, if your pipeline blows up, like we did this year with COVID and you got a bunch of refis going on, man, I hope that you still carved out an hour a day, if not more, but at least an hour to make the calls to check in with your yeah. real. Yeah, for like, sure. Yeah. Those How are many people are on your team now? Uh, there's four for my team. Plus I have an admin assistant that's watching emails, booked our appointment today, things like that. Um, like I said, we have the branch assets in regards to the front desk answer in the phone and the business development and the app scrubber. And then there's six loan officers in my branch as well. Plus ops underwriter, four processors, four assistant processors. So there's 33 total. <laughs> Okay. Wow. What, 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 maybe you said this, but what, what's an app scrubber? Somebody that's just making sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. I tell you, this is like, it's like the secret. <laughs> so there's Whoops. this, I didn't mean to bring it up for everybody. I, mean, I tell people <laughs> there's really no secrets, but it is like, the, I'll call it the secret sauce, but it's not, but you can have it. So there's, you take a high end ops person, like a really great processor, right. And you bring them down to the front. And after the LO does a great job, right? Does a great job taking an app, gets the docs, issues the prequal letter, however every state does it. And they've put together a great package rather than having it sit there and wait for the contract to come in to then turn it over to the ops department only to find out there's something wrong with the cavers. There's a foreclosure that didn't report on the credit or you just, you missed, you messed up. You just, oops, sorry. So you have that person though, that within 24 to 48 hours is literally cruising through and doing the drive report, doing the fraud report, doing the double check, checking your income, making sure, run it by the underwriter if they have to, like that second set of eyes to make sure it's a deal. And, and look, I can call on one every 30, you call the realtor and say, hey man, don't put him in the car. Something came up. Give me a, give me a day. I got to check something out. Or, 
hey, sir, you know, I apologize. I miscalculated your income. I didn't see the child support. My bad. I need to lower your pr purchasing power by 10 grand. Mm -hmm. I'd rather make that call before they go out, especially in, in this environment with multiple offers and painstakingly. Imagine the realtor that made 15 offers on houses, sight unseen too. And, and then I'm going, thanks for the contract. And then I go, oops, I did something. Yeah, else. yeah, well, spot. there goes your business. Yep. Yeah, so that person now, all, here's the other thing that, that that one does, Dan. When we were meeting people in person or when we do it virtually, that person also meets to do what I used to do for JB, which was go over the disclosures. Hmm. So I'm, I, can, I can pitch it, lock it, talk to them about the payment, schmooze a little bit and then say, hey, great. So my scrubber person, my loan coordinator, we call it, the loan coordinator is going to come in and, you know, been with me for eight years. He's awesome. He's going to go over the disclose, the technical part of the disclosures. It's really important. If you have any questions, I'm going to come in after and, and answer any questions that he wasn't able to. I'm sure he's going to handle the most of them. Talk to you later. And that could be on Zoom. And then I just go away, make my sales calls. They come back and tell me they're ready and I come in. Or it could be in the front desk of my office. I have one room that's called the signing room and people just come in. And rather than take my sales time away or my other loan officers sales time away. They come in, meet them. Hey, here's the loan coordinator. Great. You guys have fun. I leave, make some calls, do some notes, whatever. Come back in after. Thank you so much. Can I count on you to refer me somebody? I love that, man. It's a, a little tricky with COVID though, right? I mean, right, we're going, everything's on Zoom. Yeah. So, so if they're, they're meeting on Zoom with the customer and then calling you in or scheduling another zoom meeting something like that someone behind the scenes right now that's watching you and i that just pops up at, at once we're all done right <laughs> <laughs> man i love that